Um, I'm amazed that so many of you want to learn about how to write unit tests for your Java architecture with ArcUnit. Um, first uh, sentence to myself, I'm Roland, I'm, from, I'm a freelancer from Germany and I help project teams to bring their Java systems, Java legacy systems into the future. And when I prepared this talk, I, would, I started thinking, um, how could I start this talk? And, and I looked onto my calendar on my desk at home, and there was this quote from the Austrian composer Anton Bruckner, um, whoever wishes to build high towers must spend much time near the foundation. And I thought, that's the quote that fits perfectly to software architecture. And when we don't spend so much time on the foundation or on our architecture, um, some strange things will happen. For example, when we look at the Leaning Tower of Pisa in Italy, um, yeah, we have, they built this tower uh, back in the medieval age um, on a muddy ground and didn't spend so much time on their foundation and it started leaning. And they already noticed it during the construction time and tried to adjust um, something so that it gets upright again, but they had to stop in the middle of building so that only half so they can build only half of the tower because otherwise it would be too risky. But let's talk about software architecture. Um, Usually, uh, software architecture may look like this. So we have a nice layered architecture. The first two layers of our architecture look relatively okay, but then we have something that's nah, not so nice. And we build towers on top or build yeah, high towers on top. And I would say they will collapse at some point. Or another thing is um, this software architecture I found on the blog uh, monkey user um, that, that's labeled with version 2.0.1. And we can see here also at the foundation of our uh, software architecture some temporary hacks. And why does it is? Why does software is created this way. Um, usually, we would create a nice architecture before we start coding, and we build, uh, we define layers, we define module dependencies, and everything should be rock solid, and nothing should collapse in the end. But somehow, the code does not reflect the architecture. Um, but why does it happen anyway? So. Let's look at the documented architecture. And I think nobody wants to read such um, books of written text or diagrams. And more than that, um, we don't want to read it every time we change the code base. Or we don't even want to remember all that stuff that is written there. So this is usually the challenge we have. Uh, we have the defined architecture rules and we have the code. And in the end, it will eventually be the case that the architecture that we defined and the code that we write will somehow diverge. So, because nobody will um, read the documentation all the time, and most of the time, or we will review if the code. Um, matches the architecture that we define. Maybe we look at some merge request and see, oh, these two modules shouldn't interact with, an, with each other. But um, most of the time, or in most teams, um, not every merge request is reviewed like that. And additionally, we have the challenge um, that after the first version of our so software system, maybe some experienced senior developers will leave the team and new junior developers will join the team. 
and we have to transfer the knowledge of the architecture or how it should be from each team member to the other team members. And with this written stuff that we saw before, that's hardly impossible. But we are software developers, and so we want to automate stuff. And there, um, a possible solution, therefore, is this tiny or this free library arc unit. Um, I have here the mission statement from the homepage, and let's highlight some of the phrases from this mission statement. First, um, arc units. Arc unit is for checking the architecture of your Java code. For example, if we have a layered architecture where we have um, some controllers on the top and in the middle we have the service layer for our domain knowledge and on the top we have the persistence layer for the database calls, then we can check if the calls from one layer to another go down and not up and that we don't bypass some layers. This is something that you can check with ArcUnit. You can use ArcUnit with any Java unit test framework. For example, we have integration with JUnit 5 or JUnit 4, but you can use it just as plain Java library with any other unit test framework as well. For example, with um, JUnit 5, it would look simply like this, that we define some of the architecture rules simply as architecture tests, and the integration will um, just execute these tests. We will look into this in a few minutes. Um, ArcUnit can check dependencies between packages, classes, layers, slices, or any other code units that we have in our um, system. For example, if we have different modules, like in this case, module one, module two, module three, and we have classes in each of these modules that call each other, we can check with arc unit that we don't have a cycle between these modules, so that, we, that it's allowed to call from module one to module two, and module two to module three, but if we have another call from module three up to module one, we have a circular dependency and with arc unit we can define that we do not want circular dependencies in our code base. And another thing is arc unit analyzes the given Java bytecode into a code structure. So every information that is available in the Java bytecode can be anal analyzed with ArcUnit. Um, the class structure looks a bit like this. You don't, uh, the details are not so relevant, but um, we have Java class, or ArcUnit imports everything as Java classes, which have Java members like fields and code units, and those code uh, units are constructors or methods or fields. Uh, or static, initial static initializers or something like that. And we have all these dependencies between, so field accesses or construction co constructor calls or method calls. And on top of that, we can go through this code structure and see if the code um, matches our architecture rules. But since we are developers, we want to see some code. Um, I fear the, um, just as an example, taking the Spring Pet Clinic um, repository, which is a simple demo application on how to use the Spring framework. And let's test the architecture with ArcUnit. The first thing I did is add a single dependency. This is the one we want to use. In this case, I want to use the integration with JUnit 5. So I choose the dependency to ArcUnit JUnit 5. But you can just use um, ArcUnit itself if you want to use it somewhere else. 
then I defined um, another test class because everything or typically arc unit tests are executed similar like unit tests so that you can start right away. And let me start with one first test. Um, it's typically, oops, public static final arc rule so that we define everything as an architecture rule, as an arc rule. And first we want to check, um, let's say we have several controllers in our application and um, they should have consistent naming. Um, and since it's a content, we have to use the screen case. And we say um, it's arc rule definition dot classes. And what you will see now is arc unit provides a very rich fluent API so that we can define all those rules with an API. For example, we can say classes that are annotated with the um, controller annotation or um, have a name ending with controller. So these are my controller classes, everything that looks like a controller and they should have a consistent naming. And to be consistent, we also want all those classes that look like a controller to be annotated with the controller class and have a name ending with controller. And sometimes developers need a reason why this rule exists and we can also add uh, append and because, because controller should be easy to find. Okay, let's execute the test. And okay, it's green because we have, because our code matches the architecture and it's for the test finished after one second and um, I need to explain for that another annotation here on top which is the analyze classes annotation. It's basically the hint for ArcUnit which classes need to be analyzed and against which classes the rules should be executed. So the first step ArcUnit takes is to analyze all these classes, namely all classes that reside in packages like the pet clinic application or in sub packages. And then it matches or then invokes all these architecture rules. But what happens if we have um, something not good defined, for example, if we um, misspelled our controller class because um, or it's uh, let's say it's it's a service but the annotation says it's a controller so when we look at the package we don't see the controller in here but arc unit hopefully gives us a red test in this case ha I love failing tests. And it says pretty clear what the failure is or what the error is because we have an architecture violation and it says the rule classes that are annotated with add controller or have a simple name ending with controller should be annotated with add controller and should have a simple name ending with controller because controller should be easy to find. And then it says the class vet service does not have a simple name ending with controller. And IntelliJ provides me a link to get to the class. And I see, ah, it's annotated with controller, but does not have the name um, controller. So it's, uh, yeah, revert it back so that everything is green. But what we as we see here is the error message is generated from the rule we defined. So everything 
that we defined using the Fluent API is automatically transferred into the error message text in case of failures. Okay, the next thing I want to try is um, check dependencies between those between our modules. Um, when we look at the application, we have two modules. One is for the owner, for the pet owners and for the pets. And one is for the vet. And the architecture looked like this, that those modules should be independent from each other. And we can define this additionally at um, as arc unit rule. And let's call this dependencies between modules. And this is not a single rule that we want to define, but that are these are two separate rules I want to define because the owner should not depend on the vet and the vet should not depend on the owner. And I can compose multiple um, rules with the composite arc rule. And I say the, say the first rule is classes that, uh, that reside in a package um, owner. So I say every class that is in a package something dot owner dot something should and now i want to negate some stuff and that's not really part of the fluent api but i have the possibility to compose my own conditions so i could say not depend uh, depend on classes that oh i have to import some stuff where is it? And now I can say additionally reside in a package something dot vet dot something. Oh, wrong import. I guess it's the wrong import. Reside in a package. Okay, maybe. And I copy the same stuff. So, herb. And flip around the packages. Vet and owner. So that these two modules or two packages should not depend on each other. And why does it not compile? Why type in our condition? Okay, Java class dot predicate dot reside. There it is. Okay, and with the static import, it looks nice again. And let's run the test. I hope that, oops, there's something broken from the last one. And the first test, first, uh, both tests are green and the dependencies are correctly defined. But addition, one thing we see also is the second test finished much faster than the first test because ArcUnit analyzes the code base only once and it doesn't change between this, this, between those two tests. But what if I, um, Add a dependency between those. For example, if I have the vet controller and I mm, reuse the uh, the owner repository, um, or just the owner, the owner. That's good. This is now a dependent. Now I introduced a dependency between the vet module and the owner module, and we have a failing test, which says. The rule again, 
um, and it says the constructor that controller calls the constructor owner, which is a which is an architecture violation, and I have to resolve this somehow. And in this case, I resolve it by simply reverting. Okay. Um, let me get back to the architecture tests. So now we have seen um, how to declare um, rules for single classes, for example, like naming. We saw um, a rule to define dependencies between classes. The next thing is we want to check um, the dependent or the architecture itself. And the next rule is a bit longer, so I skipped the part of writing it. And ArcUnit um, provides some rules for common architecture for common architectures. For example, um, I defined here the layered architecture, and I say we have a layer called controller, which is defined by all, all classes that are annotated with at controller are part of the controller layer. Then I say, for example, that the domain layer is everything defined by Spring Data Repositories. And then I define the persistence layer is everything that is annotated with, um, and with the entity annotation. If that's correctly defined, I'm not sure, but for this example, let's say that's our architecture. And then I define that this layer controller may not be accessed by any other layer, that the domain layer may only be accessed by the controller layer, and that the persistence layer may only be accessed by the controller and by the domain layer. And hopefully this application matches the architecture. Yeah, the test is green. And for example, if I go to the owner, which is an entity, and I go to some code and simply introduce a dependency to a controller, um, this is also an access um, to another class, we should get an error. Uh, which says, first we get all this information, how our architecture is defined. And then we get the violation that the method owner get address references the class object of visit controller, which is not allowed. In this case, the um, persistence layer um, accesses the controller layer. And I can go there and we have the failing call. So. Okay. Um, so the next question would be: um, Have I? Uh, should I go to every project and define all these layer again in test cases? Shouldn't it be more, or wouldn't it be nice to? define the architecture directly in our production code. And therefore, I want to introduce another framework, which is called J-Molecules. And I go a step further and get back to the POM. And J-Molecules is, a, is another, is another um, little Java framework um, which has the purpose that you can define the architecture of your code or architectural concepts directly in your production code. For example, I used the module for the layered architecture. And now I can say, for example, the VET controller um, is part of the application layer. And for example, um, the VET repository is, let's say it's part of the domain layer and the VET itself is part of the domain. And let's say something like a cache configuration, which is 
typical the infrastructure and not really part of our domain is part of the infrastructure layer. So with J molecules, I can directly define this architectural concepts directly in the code. Um, another case would be if I use domain driven design, I could define um, that this is an entity because I don't have the dependency currently in my project that only provides me the Jakarta persistence entity, but um, we can also say it's the J molecules DDD entity. Oops, domain layer. And once I define the architecture in my code, I can simply go to my architecture test and say, um, let's say it's an architecture test, public static. Um, J molecules uh, layers. And J molecules also provides arc unit rules to test um, the definitions that you provided in the production code. For example, I want to use, want to ensure that the layering architecture is correctly defined or correctly, uh, correctly realized. And that's the case. But if I go to the um, that again, which is part of the domain layer, which should not interact with the application layer, and I reintroduce, oops, get name, and I reintroduce the dependency to the application layer, we get two failing tests because we test the same thing in two different approaches. And it also um, puts, uh, writes the definition and it says again the method references the class object which is not allowed in this case. Okay, um, so ArcUnit itself is really nice if you want to um, or it's re relatively easy to use if you start a new project. But what if you have a legacy project which is several years old and where you are sure that there are several violations in there. With unit tests, you have the problem either they are green and everything is okay, or they are red and break the build if there is a violation in there. It would be nice to have something in between, something like a, the unit test should be yellow or something. And therefore, we have also a solution. Um, I go to this part and oops. Where is it? Yeah. Oh, whoop, whoop, whoop. Da. there. Okay. For example, I added a unit test that every controller that modifies our system in somehow um, should lock with SLF4J. So I defined a rule that says methods that are annotated with um, at post mapping should lock. Lock itself is not a condition that is provided by ArcUnit, but in this case is implemented um, for this test only. And it simply goes through the method, through this, pr through the provided method and checks every method call and looks if there's something um, or some of these methods call the logger class from SLF4J. In this case, I would say this method should lock or this method locks or does not lock. But the implementation is not relevant here. But 
Um, the problem is when I introduced the rule, we have several mappings of several methods that currently violate the rule. And I have now two options. The first is I go through all those violations and fix it, or because I don't have so many time, I can use those little tool called freezing, which says I freeze the current violation and say this is the state from which I from where I start. This is okay, I know that, but I don't want to introduce new violations. For example, if I run the test, everything looks green, but if we go to some post mapping, we see there is no logging at all. For example, in this case. Um, the magic in this case is that ArcUnit stores the current violations in a text file and whenever it finds a violation, it checks if it's a frozen violation in this case and simply ignore this one violation. But if I introduce here, for example, um, SLF, um, let me see. Introduce SLF4J for a second. Pet controller. And go to the post mapping again. Where is it here? Hello. And run the test again. It should still be green, correct? Okay. But one thing is interesting the file got modified. Oops. Um, yeah, I don't want to commit. And ArcUnit um, went to the for, to this configuration file with the frozen architecture rule and saw this violation does not exist anymore. So it removes the violation from the text file and says this is resolved. But if I go back to the pet controller and introduce the violation again by simply removing um, the logging call from the point of arc unit i introduced a new violation and the test started failing again it says um, methods that are not annotated with post mapping should lock and the method bup, 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 process creation form does not lock and i can go to the definition so the freezing mechanism is a very helpful tool to introduce ArcUnit into an existing code base by simply um, committing to the current point, to the current state that we have several violations. And furthermore, we get a to-do list that we can, um, on that we can work step by step, step by step to reduce all those violations to get a clean state in the end. So if I go back to here, um, we saw that we have currently, typically the challenges that we have somehow an architecture defined and we have somehow the code and those sometimes not really match with, it, with each other because nobody reads the documentation and nobody reviews if all those dependencies and namings are really correct or maybe something slips through because we have a merge request with 1000 lines of changes and um, we have um, uh, we'll end in a state where the architecture and the code does not match really but with ArcUnit you get the chance that all these architecture rules that you have defined will get executed automatically with each CI build and that you get failing unit tests um, once you introduce a new violation. And so these violations cannot um, go to a production system, for example, when you introduce unwanted dependencies. And so it's also use, easy to use in legacy projects 
So when you want to start with an old application and want to transform it so that it matches a good architecture, you can start using it with this freezing rules or just with small rules and extend step by step. But with every testing framework, it's the case that testing can only detect the presence of errors, but it cannot show their absence. And with this quote, I want to close and I want to encourage you to use ArcUnit in your current project and into in your next projects. Thank you. I think we have still some minutes left for questions. There is one. Um, one more question. You said that uh, within other um, open source tools like German mole molecules, you can uh, define also the, um, the layer types. Mm -hmm. uh, is it possible? Uh, so, if if you do it like this, yeah, um, is it necessary to annotate any class, or that this is, for example, a repository or on domain domain on control or something like this, or is it possible to also have this? more generally to have it reside in, 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 in a special package, for example, that all of the classes in this package are of a sim, uh, special type? Um, it's a good question. Um, I'm not really sure because I didn't try it exactly. Um, I think because JMolecules is from one of the Spring developers, from Oli, um, I think there are some mechanisms used that so that you can use, for example, composed annotations, for example, um, that you can say, um, where is it? That I can say my controller, which says it is a spring controller and it's part of the application layer, for example. And on every controller, you would then use, instead of the spring controller annotation, the my controller annotation. And through the composed annotations, um, it would then say, um, let me remove this here and use it here. And spring would go to this annotation and looks if this annotation is annotated with controller, then it's in a controller. And I think, I'm not sure if ArcUnit is it or JMolecules goes also the way that it, whoops, where is it? Uh, the with controller, that it goes, ah, here's the my controller. Let's see if this my controller is annotated with application layer. And yes, it is annotated so that you can define every class that is my controller is also part of the application layer. And another thing I would think is possible, but I haven't tried it uh, also, is if you put it on the package. Let's see if that compiles. It compiles so that we can say um, the application, everything in the system package is part of the application layer. Or in this case, it's more like the infrastructure layer infrastructure layer so but i'm not sh really sure if it works but i would guess that it works okay thank you mm -hmm. thank you very much for the talk uh, my question is um, this exception file for the freeze feature that you have shown, how do you control that? Do you check that in into version control or how do you sync that between uh, different developers and the CACD? Yeah, it's simply Sorry. committed with the uh, version control. Okay, thank you very much. 
and otherwise new developers that um, or other developers in the team would simply get again this list of 100 violations. Thanks also from, for the talk. I have a question regarding the same topic. Um, if I change a frozen method, does it remove it from here immediately or does it only remove it when I fix the problem as well? Um, good question. Let me, let's test. <laughs> um, we have the pet controller. Um, go to this. And when I touch the application by simply, or touch the method by simply removing some code, but do not, do not really resolve the problem, it's still green because the violation um, is still there. I didn't touch the method regarding this violation, so ArcUnit still ignores it, but once I resolve the um, violation, it removes this violation from this text file and um, will fail once I introduce the violation again. Um, in this case, um, IntelliJ itself didn't sort it. Um, I think ArcUnit will see it as a new violation because it does not know this, um, this new method. But there are two things. Um, this, uh, I think this, is inter or in this case you can use uh, regular expressions or I'm not sure if it was this file um, so that you can define everything that is in the class pet controller should be ignored or everything in the package owner so that you can see as uh, say owner dot everything and oh, delete the rest but I haven't tried that recently, so I'm not really sure. Okay, then thanks for your questions and your time and enjoy the rest of the conference and the beer later. <laughs>